This lecture is about the resting membrane potential of neurons. We call it the resting membrane potential because it's the charge or the potential across the membrane when the neuron is resting. That is, it's not actively conducting an action potential or receiving synaptic input. So this is kind of um, an impossible uh, scenario for a neuron, but you can create this in the lab and you can measure it. So it does exist. It just doesn't exist for very long, if at all, in real life. Because neurons are always communicating. So the resting membrane potential is more of an idea uh, than it is a, a, a real thing that neurons take advantage of. But every neuron does have a membrane potential that it tends to gravitate toward. Um, and the activity that it receives in its dendrites, and of course propagates down its, its axon, pulls it away from that. That is the resting membrane potential. But even at rest, neurons aren't doing nothing. Ions are always moving across the membrane. There might not be a net flux of ions that creates a measurable current or potential change, but they're still moving. They just might be moving equally in both directions. So something is always happening. We're, we're never really resting. We're going to talk about the membrane potential in, in four parts here. Really, we're, we're, it's all about the passive, um, inactive electrical activity that goes on in neurons. So we'll first set up the ionic imbalance across the membrane. Then we're going to introduce the concept of reversal potentials, and you really need to know these. These will help you understand how ions behave. Each ion is going to have its own reversal potential, but all ions that are able to move across the membrane will then contribute to resting membrane potential. Finally, we'll talk about the passive properties of membranes themselves and how that affects the movement of charge into and within neurons. In the first part, we're just going to talk about ionic imbalance across the membrane and to introduce the idea that every membrane has a charge. All living cells have a membrane potential. And that's just a potential at the membrane. In the cartoon world, it's always negative 70 millivolts. In the real world, it's often time pretty close to that if you're a neuron, but there's some variability. Now this charge at the membrane is created by several things. One of the things that's going to create a charge difference at the membrane is the imbalance of ions that we find. So even though there's just about as much stuff dissolved inside the cell as out, so it's not hyperosmotic, at least not too much, just a little bit, it's hyperosmotic enough that it's plump, but not so much that it swells up and bursts. And it's not hypoosmotic, in other words, not enough dissolved stuff to support enough water being inside, so it doesn't shrivel. So even though there's roughly the same amounts of stuff inside as out, the devil's in the details. What stuff is there in the cell and out? <clears throat> There's only a few ions that we really need to think of. In fact, we only need to think of sodium, potassium, and chloride. We'll consider calcium, but there's almost no calcium flux at rest, so we can kind of sweep it under the table. We'll introduce it just so we remember that intracellular calcium levels remain low. But the imbalance here, it's listed on that table. You can always look this stuff up. But we have a lot of sodium outside compared to inside, a lot of chloride outside compared to inside. <laughs> calcium levels are fairly low across the board. That says calcium there, you just can't see it because you won't find a lot of calcium floating around in the cell, at least not a healthy cell. And high levels of potassium inside compared to outside. Now. The way that you can remember this is either by just remembering it or you can think about how life probably started. And that's probably somewhere floating around in the ocean. The ocean is of course made of salt water. Salt would be sodium chloride. So the outside world when life was first created had a lot of sodium and chloride outside of it. So outside the living part, so outside of cells we have sodium chloride, we have salt water sodium chloride outside. 
that leaves us with potassium to pick up the slack, because remember we have to have about the same amount of dissolved stuff. Another thing that contributes to that would be all the phosphate groups that are floating around within the cell. <clears throat> These are negatively charged. And that's going to kind of bias the cell toward having a, a negative membrane potential. And what it's also going to do is mandate that we don't have high intracellular calcium levels because calcium phosphate will form. And calcium phosphate is insoluble in the high micromolar, low millimolar ranges. And by the way, all of these ions, except for intracellular calcium, are going to be present in millimolar concentrations. So we're definitely in the right concentration range to get calcium phosphate crystals. We don't want that. Crystals are going to potentially puncture the membrane. Plus, then we lose our calcium and our phosphate. And phosphates are essential components of uh, nucleic acids. And we attach them to proteins and lipids and carbohydrates to change their function. So, because of all the phosphates floating around, we have a bias toward negative membrane potential, but we also have to keep calcium levels low. So, just remember how life started and some basic chemistry, and you can figure out your ion concentrations that way. Now the way that we measure the charge at the membrane nowadays is through patch clamp recording. <clears throat> a long time ago we would have to puncture the cell in order to try to access the inside, but now what we do, we'll take a glass pipette and just attach it to the surface of the cell. This will be filled with some sort of fluid, it'll have an electrode in there. So here's our fluid filled pipette. We'll apply a little bit of a vacuum. So we'll apply some negative pressure. So you pull back on the syringe, it applies negative pressure, and that, that membrane is going to get pulled tightly against the glass. And membranes tend to stick to glass. So you can form a nice seal. This is what we call cell attached. You're just attached to the cell. And you can measure electrical activity while you're cell attached, but you just don't have great access. So you can measure something big like an action potential, but you'll never look at membrane potential or synaptic potentials. In order to do that, you apply a little more vacuum until you rupture the cell membrane. You don't pull so hard that you suck out all the contents of the cell, just until you see it open up. Then, at this point, you can control the electrical activity of the cell. You can either use what we call voltage clamp to measure currents, so you hold the voltage constant, or you can use current clamp to measure voltages, so you hold the current constant. This is kind of like a thermostat, where you can set it to, I don't know, 71, and if it goes above, you apply some cool air to bring it down, if it goes below, you apply some warm air. So what we'll do is set, let's say, our, our we'll use voltage clamp to measure currents, so if we're clamping the voltage at, I don't know, we'll say minus 70, <clears throat> any deviation away from minus 70, we're going to correct by injecting current. And this is why, whenever you look at a sodium current, it looks like this. Why would sodium flowing into the cell be a negative current? Because this is what we injected. What sodium did was actually create a positive current and we just tried to offset that so that we don't change our membrane potential. So all the currents that we record are really just the currents that we injected, which are the mirror image of the real life currents. And that's why you get inward currents with sodium, even though it should be depolarizing. We'll look at some recordings throughout the class, so you should get used to looking at those, but that's what we're talking about whenever we, we mention patch clamp recording. We put a pipette on the surface, we break open a small hole, and then we either control the current to measure voltage, or we control the voltage to measure current. <clears throat> and if you were to carry out some patch clamp recordings to look at the membrane potential of different types of cell, you'd see that it's variable. Neurons we're going to call negative 70, but they have a range of possible membrane potentials. The same thing is true for glial cells and any other type of cell out there. <clears throat> and when we're talking about rest, it just means when the cell isn't doing anything. This is mostly a phenomenon that we see in the laboratory rather than real life, but what it does is tell us where does that cell want to hang out. And before we can think about 
where the cell is hanging out as a whole, we need to think about each individual ion. And then we can put them all together. Now, ions, whenever we allow them to move across the membrane, they can move through either channels, carriers, or pumps. Pumps are going to go against the concentration gradient. They're going to be the slowest. So they may move hundreds of ions per second. Carriers are a little bit faster. They'll move hundreds of thousands of ions per second. Channels are the fastest. They'll move hundreds of millions of ions per second. So when you see big currents, it has to be a channel. They're the only ones that have uh, uh, the bandwidth to generate a measurable current. You can get some transporter currents, but man, they're small and you really got to work for them. <clears throat> so this ion imbalance right here, a whole lot of sodium outside, very little inside, that's what's going to determine the reversal potential of this ion. That's what this section is about, reversal potentials. When is it that the two forces acting on this ion are going to cancel out? First, let's introduce ion channels. So this is what ions are mostly going to be moving through. They have other options, but channels are the fastest. There's a few parts that an ion channel has to have. The first is an ion pore. So, Ions can't move through the lipid bilayer because they're charged. And that hydrophilic core, I'm sorry, that hydrophobic core is going to prevent those charged molecules from moving through it. So what we have to do is create a hole. That's what an ion pore is. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a hole that ions move through. And within that, we have a region called the selectivity filter that determines what kind of ion does it move. <clears throat> is it going to move a cation or an anion? Is it specific for sodium? Will it let any monovalent cation move? Then we have some optional components. There's the activation gate that will open the ion pore or close it. And there's the inactivation gate which will block the ion pore. And blocking is not the same thing as closing. We will get to that next lecture. So these are kind of related. One opens and closes the pore. That's the activation gate. And the inactivation gate blocks it. So it doesn't matter if you're open or closed. If you're blocked, no ions are going to move. So the inactivation gate will trump the activation gate. <clears throat> we have a bunch of different ion channels out there, uh, particularly the potassium channel family. Great diversity um, in ion channels. Generally speaking, we're going to see differences in terms of what ions do they move. So negatively charged or positively charged. Do we care about the specific ion? Is it only sodium? Is it only calcium? Is it any ion at all, any uh, cation? So those would be non-specific cation channels. Some only let positive one, so monovalent cations move through. So sodium or potassium. Uh, no, no calcium, no magnesium. Lithium might be okay. Gating, of course, that's optional. <clears throat> Right? It could be uh, that a neurotransmitter has to bind, some sort of ligand. We call that a ligand-gated ion channel. Sometimes we have to change the voltage of the membrane. Those will be voltage-gated ion channels. Some have no gating, and that's what we're talking about today. Leak channels, those that are open at rest. They're always there. They bias the cell towards some membrane potential, toward that resting membrane potential. And then you have the option of having inactivating or not. Most ion channels aren't going to inactivate, but there's an important class that does, which we'll get to next lecture. <clears throat> Those would be, of course, the voltage-gated sodium channels. If you have a mutation in their inactivation gate, they'll create persistent sodium currents. And that's what we're seeing here, that red trace. That mutation creates a persistent sodium current, and neurons that have more of this are a little more depolarized, a little more excitable. There's, of course, differences in the kinetics in terms of how quickly they open and close, how quickly they bind and unbind their ligands. That will, of course, determine um, their activity. And, of course, the drugs that target them. <clears throat> Here's a few examples of different drugs that target NMDA receptors, and they're going to target different types of NMDA receptors. So in next unit, uh, we're going to introduce um, the structure of neurotransmitter receptors, and what we're going to find is that they're always made of multiple subunits. In each one of those subunits has different types that it could be. So the uh, glue N2 subunit, for example, you could have A, B, C, or D. And different drugs act on them, and that's what we're seeing.
uh, right here. They also have different kinetics. Um, they can also have different ion selectivity as well. So those different subunits that make up the multimeric neurotransmitter receptors, that's what's going to endow them with these different properties that we just ran through. We'll get the specifics of that next unit. Right now we just need to appreciate that there's a bunch of different ion channels out there. But when they open, the same thing's going to happen. Ions are going to move in accordance with two different forces. There's the diffusive force that's established by this. <clears throat> that concentration difference. So diffusion, we're going to go from high to low. When particles move randomly, they tend to spread out. That's all diffusion is saying. If you put a bunch of particles here, they're going to tend to spread out. There's no desire, it's just what random motion does for us. We go from high to low, just by chance. So the diffusive force, for example, is going to push sodium in. It'll push chloride in. It'll push potassium out. It'll push calcium in. Now, of course, these are charged, and so is the cell. So, we measured it to be, let's say, negative 70 millivolts. So the electromotive force, because it's negatively charged, well, that's going to bring sodium in too, but that's going to push chloride out. It's going to pull calcium, I'm sorry, potassium in, and it's also going to pull calcium in as well. So you can see in some cases we have agreement. Sodium and calcium definitely want to come into the cell. Both of these forces agree. Chloride and potassium are a mixed bag. Chloride's going to tend to move in at rest. Potassium is definitely going to move out at rest. And we'll be able to predict that once we calculate the reversal potentials. But both of these are going to affect the ions. <clears throat> now, just uh, so we're all clear here, we're not having a big movement of ions. We're not going to really change the concentration of ions. So that diffusive force is going to be constant. Because the area where we have movement of ions is very local. It's only going to be within a few nanometers of the membrane. So take a look at this illustration here. What I've done is drawn for you a pretty typical cell in part A. A 15 micron diameter is by no means a huge neuron. That's pretty standard. There are some that are smaller, some that are bigger. Above that, what I've done is blow up the membrane so you can see the lipid bilayer, and you can actually see that red area flanking it. So that red is where we're going to see ion movement. Now look back down at the cell. Do you see red around the cell membrane? No. Unless you're within a few nanometers of the membrane, as you can see in part B, you're not going to have much ion movement. About 100% of the ions that are right there, that are 0 nanometers away, are probably going to move through the ion channels because they're right there next to it. But as you move a few nanometers away, by the time you hit 5 or 10 nanometers, pretty much 0% of those ions are going to make it across by the time the ion channel opens and then closes. They're too far away. These are very fast events and the ions are moving randomly. So only the ions right next to the membrane are going to move we're moving a fraction of a percent of ions. We're not getting big appreciable changes in ion concentrations. So, we should always think there's a lot of sodium outside and very little inside. That diffusive force is going to remain constant. The thing that's going to change is the electrical force as the membrane potential changes. Now another reason why the diffusive force is going to be constant is because of the sodium-potassium pump. <clears throat> as sodium flows in, down its concentration gradient, and potassium flows out, down its concentration gradient, we have to reestablish this ion imbalance. Over time, those fractions of a percent would add up, so the sodium-potassium pump prevents them from adding up. So we'll pump out sodium and pump in potassium, of course, having to spend ATP, and it's about 20% of a neuron's ATP that's going to be spent just on this enzyme. Now the electrical force is going to change. So collectively, we'll think of the diffusive force and the electrical force as the electrochemical force. So they're going to act together. What's the net force on that ion? So let's think about sodium, because it's pretty clear-cut. At rest, or let's say negative 70, both 
forces are pushing it inward, and you can see that in this cartoon. As sodium flows in, it's going to line the membrane with positive charge and start to make the cells seem like it has a more positive charge. So the membrane potential will increase. This should make sense. If positive charge comes in, the cell becomes more positive. As the positive charge comes in, that electrical force is going to weaken. And when we hit zero millivolts, like we see in this cartoon, there's no more charge. With no charge on the membrane, there's no net electrical force. But we still have the diffusive force. So sodium will flow in, and it's going to flow in until the electrical force perfectly offsets the diffusive force. So when the cell is positively charged, that's going to repel sodium. Diffusion is always going to push in, and only when we get a positive charge in the cell do we push out. The more positive we are, the more strongly we push out. And you have to hit, it turns out, roughly positive 56 millivolts to offset that diffusive force. How in the world did I know that? Using the Nernst equation. So we know the concentration of ions in and out. We can flip back to that slide, and we can plug and chug. Here's the Nernst equation. There's the original form, and then if we just assume body temperature, there's a simplification there. And I've gone ahead and just calculated the reversal potential for different ions. But by taking into account the gas constant, temperature, that's going to affect the movement of ions, the charge of the ion, and Faraday's constant, those are, by the way, constants. We can just plug those in. We get our 61.5 divided by the charge times the log of the ratio of extracellular to intracellular. The reason that we take charge into account is because we have to flip it if it's positive or negative, and the additional charges are going to affect reversal potential. So, if you plug and chug, you should get pretty similar values to what I have there. And what we'll notice is that the sodium reversal potential, so VNA listed there, positive 56. The cell has to have a positive charge to offset this diffusive force. Well, what about potassium? Well, this diffusive force is going out, so we need a negative charge to offset that. And in fact, our negative charge has to be way more negative than rest, negative 102, roughly. Chloride also needs a negative charge because it wants to flow in, so to push it out, we need a negative charge. How much of a negative charge? Pretty much the same as rest, a little bit hyperpolarized. And this is why inhibitory synaptic currents don't really hyperpolarize the cell. There's pretty much no driving force. Calcium, we can see positive 125. So, we have a huge diffusive force. So to offset that, we have to be extremely positive to start to push calcium out. By knowing the reversal potential, you can predict the behavior of an ion. They're fairly powerful. So let's think about Let's think about sodium. So at reversal potential, the diffusive and electromotive forces perfectly cancel out one another. So our current Sorry, that's pretty ambiguous. The x-axis is going to show us our membrane potential, and the y-axis is going to show us current, or the movement of ions. So with sodium, we have no net current at reversal potential, because the diffusive and electromotive forces are perfectly offsetting one another. Now that doesn't mean that we have no movement of ions. They're flowing in and out at the same rates, so we get no current. Now if we're more negative than reversal. We know that sodium is going to flow in because that electrical force is now going to be a little weaker. We're not positive enough to offset the diffusive force. If we strengthen the electrical force by making the cell more positive, sodium is going to flow out. So we'll get these inward currents whenever we're below sodium's reversal, nothing at reversal, Sodium is still moving, just no net movement, and we'll get outward currents whenever we're above it. 
Same thing is true for potassium. This is clearly not drawn to scale very well. Uh, so here's negative 102. It's going to be the same thing. When we're above it, which we always are, potassium is going to flow out. Potassium will never flow in. The cell can't get below potassium's reversal, except in the lab. But in real life, potassium always flows out because we can never get below its reversal. It has the lowest reversal potential. So even if we were only permeable to potassium and nothing else at all, the lowest we could get is minus 102. The thing that you need to take away from this is that whenever an ion channel opens, that current that it creates moves the membrane potential toward that ion's reversal. And that's true all the time. I'm not going to say except when it doesn't. It always does that. If we open up sodium channels, we move toward positive 56 millivolts. If we're below that, which we will be, we'll depolarize. If we're above that, which we won't be, we'll repolarize. We're always moving toward reversal whenever we open up an ion channel. If we open up a potassium channel, we're going to move toward its reversal. If we close a potassium channel, we'll move away from its reversal. Knowing reversal potentials is really handy. And knowing the difference between your current membrane potential and the reversal will help you calculate the driving force. In other words, how much current should we expect? Well, if we're here, compare the driving force for potassium at these different potentials. The more positive we are, the greater the difference from reversal, the greater the current we should expect. And that is because, as we'll find out soon enough, V equals IR, or I equals VG. G is 1 over R. And this V here is going to be driving force. So the current has everything to do with how far you are from reversal and how many ion channels you have open. I can't stress it enough. You need to know reversal potentials. And what the cell does to generate its resting membrane potential is put together all those different reversal potentials in a weighted average. So when it's resting, that is not doing anything, the only thing that we should be considering are leak channels. Nothing that requires a neurotransmitter or a change in membrane potential to open. Just the leak channels. So the leak channels are going to then contribute to rest. If we were to plug and chug in this equation, this is the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation. This is the Nernst equation three times and put together. So we have the Nernst equation for potassium, the Nernst equation for sodium, and the Nernst equation for chloride. And they're put together and weighted by the permeability for those ions. So this is just a weighted average. And we're weighting each one of those reversal potentials based on how permeable the cell is to them. Now it turns out, at rest, cells are most permeable to potassium. Those values are given here in blue. So potassium is 1, that's what we're going to call our max. 0.04 for sodium, that means we're about 4% uh, as permeable to sodium as we are to potassium. About 45% for chloride. So even though the resting potential is pretty close to chloride's reversal, we actually have a much greater potassium current than chloride. So we're more permeable to potassium, and that's to offset that little bit of persistent sodium current that every neuron has. <clears throat> so you can plug into the golden hodgkin katz equation and figure out what the resting membrane potential would be as you change your permeabilities. You should also be able to reason this out. So let's say that we're resting at minus 70, and we increase the permeability to potassium. We're always going to move toward potassium's reversal. Potassium reverses at minus 102, so we're going to go somewhere closer to minus 102. So we'll hyperpolarize. If we open up a sodium channel, if we open up a bunch of sodium channels, we're going to move towards sodium's reversal. So we're going to depolarize. We're going to move toward positive 56. How close we get to that depends on the change in P.
So if we become massively permeable to sodium, we'll move much closer to its reversal. If we're just a little bit more permeable, we'll move slightly. You can plug it into the goldman hodgkin katz equation and get a look at that yourself. Uh, there should be a calculator on the class website that you can play with. So the last thing to talk about here would be the passive properties of membranes. Because membranes uh, are, are going to have uh, capacitance and resistance, and that's going to affect how charge moves. So the capacitance of the membrane, that's going to store charge there, and the resistance of the membrane is going to determine how well charge moves through it. In some cases, we want a lower resistance so we can actually bring charge in. In some cases, we want higher resistance so we can keep charge in. So the membrane resistance at rest is fairly high, and this is because all we have are leak channels open. <clears throat> so those leak channels are a small subset of the total ion channels that a neuron has. So when a neurotransmitter gets dumped on the dendrites, that's going to open up ligand gated ion channels. So the resistance will drop, or the conductance will increase. They're the reciprocal of one another. So the cartoon membrane on top there, only leak. The cartoon membrane on the bottom has the same leak channel open, but in this case, there are some gated ion channels that have opened up. Let's say they're ligand gated and we're looking at dendrites. Maybe it's the axon and they're voltage gated. Doesn't matter. The, the active conductances uh, are, are going to only occur because ion channels have opened up. And when ion channels open up, resistance drops. So you can think of ion channels as resistors or conductors, basically the same thing. The lipid bilayer itself is going to be a capacitor. So a capacitor is anything that stores charge. And the membrane is an excellent capacitor because it's very, very thin. Because it's so thin, the charges can interact with one another on both sides of the membrane. It also has that hydrophobic core, so charges can't move through it. If charge can move, you're not storing it very well. So those two properties make the membrane an excellent capacitor. So the more membrane you have, the more capacitance you have. That means the more charge you're going to store. So the bigger the neuron, the more membrane it has, the more capacitance it has. Because of that, <clears throat> those bigger neurons are going to be less responsive to very fast inputs. They just have more capacitance. So if we put those two ideas together, the resistors, that would be the ion channels, and the, the capacitors, that would be the possible lipid bilayer there, we can think of the membrane as just an RC circuit. Of course, there's the sodium potassium ATPase that's going to act as a battery to keep the charge there, the charge indifference, so it's creating the potential. And then that potential is either moving through resistors to create currents, or it's being stored at the membrane. Now, the capacitance of the membrane is going to essentially cut in on those currents that are generated. It's going to slow down the rate of current change because the first thing that's going to happen is charging the membrane. So remember that ion flux is very local, just within a few nanometers of the membrane. So when we have the brief opening of an ion channel like we're seeing over here, the first thing to happen, those positive charges that are surrounding the outside of the cell, they're attracted to the negative charges that are stored inside. So the membrane is a capacitor storing charge. When we open the ion channel, so when we decrease resistance at that site, current moves through. If we decrease resistance, current has to increase. V equals IR. So we open up the ion channel, ions move. That positive charge is first going to interact with all those negative charges that are at the membrane. So it's going to first displace those negative charges, and then negative charges will displace the positive charge because they'll be attracted to the positive charge inside. That is what we call the capacitance current. <clears throat> so the first thing we have to do when ions move into the cell, they have to get stored at the membrane. That creates your capacitance current. After we've charged the membrane, then we have our resistance current. Then we can move away and we can start to have a measurable change on membrane potential. <clears throat>
measurable by patch clamp recording. Of course, the capacitance current is going to be sufficient to affect the, the membrane potential for things like voltage-gated ion channels. Those will respond immediately, but our recordings are going to have that little bit of delay. So look over here. <clears throat> what they've done is deliver a square wave of current, but they don't see a square wave for the change in membrane potential. So what they're delivering is this, a depolarizing current. Now, if the membrane didn't have any capacitance, it would look just like that. Of course, we know that the membrane is an excellent capacitor, so we're first going to have to charge the capacitor. And then when we remove the current, we decharge the capacitor. Notice the difference. It's a little bit slower. It kind of rounds out the response. That current isn't gone. It's still there. You can see it on the bottom in this figure. That capacitance current is the very first current that we get, but it's stored at the membrane, so we just don't measure it in our recordings. <clears throat> As we open up additional ion channels, we'll get additional current, and only after we've charged the membrane are we going to see a change in membrane potential. That's caused by that resistance current. And the resistance current and the capacitance current are going to sum together to create that total injected current. So yes, we injected a square wave, but, well, the membrane robbed us of a little bit. So there's our capacitance current. Here's our membrane potential. And here's the injected current. So the resistance current is going to look just like the change in membrane potential. Because that membrane potential is going to be based off of our resistance current and how many resistors we've opened. In other words, the number of ion channels that we've opened up. So deliver more current or have more channels for it to move through, you'll see a bigger change in membrane potential. The big idea here is that as you have more capacitance, you're going to have slower changes in the membrane potential. <clears throat> so resistance and capacitance are both going to affect the movement of charge once it's in the cell. So after we've gone through, we've had the capacitance current rob us of a little bit, then we have that resistance current where we're actually moving away from the membrane and spreading within the cell, then our movement is going to depend on what's the capacitance of the remaining membrane. If the rest of the membrane has a whole bunch of capacitance still, because it's not myelinated, we have to charge that. That's going to affect charge movement. And what's the resistance? If we have a leaky membrane, the charge is just going to go right back out. So, we're going to come in through ion channels, and we're also going to exit through ion channels. If they're open. Both of these are going to be affected by myelination. We'll talk about that next time. But myelin is just going to affect the passive properties of the membrane. Now we also have to consider the passive properties of the cell interior. So the internal resistance is based on diameter. Let's say this is a cross section of a dendrite. And here's another dendrite. Much lower internal resistance here than here. Well that matters. Remember that dendrites taper. Now what that does is essentially bias electrical flow toward the cell body because you're going to take the path of least resistance, but what it also does is amplify potentials. So the potentials that you record in distal dendrites, we see that on the left here, are going to be much greater because, in case I haven't mentioned it, V equals IR. So internal resistance, much higher here. So those synaptic currents that you're getting are going to create a much greater potential change here. <clears throat>
And because of that, the effect on the cell body is essentially the same. Even though they're much further away, this amplification of synaptic current amplitude as well as active conductances in dendrites is going to ensure that regardless of synapse distance, you have a relatively uniform response in the cell body. So that tapering nature of the dendrites is fairly important for shuttling electricity in the right direction, like we mentioned last lecture, but also in making sure that those that are further away are starting off with a much greater amplitude. <clears throat> v equals IR. Now the movement of charge depends on the resistance within the cell, the resistance of the membrane, and the capacitance of the membrane. We can put together resistance and capacitance of the membrane to calculate the tau constant. So the, the tau is the time constant that talks about how long does it take <coughs> for the membrane potential to change by about 63%. <clears throat> So roughly this amount of time, where it's dropped 63%. That value is going to be equal to the capacitance times the resistance of the membrane. Let's think about this. If you have higher resistance of the membrane, it's going to take longer to change the charge there because you're not allowing the movement of ions. If you have greater capacitance, well, then you're going to be robbing more of those charges that move through. So it's going to take longer to overcome this and start to have a resistance current that changes membrane potential. So by decreasing the capacitance of the membrane, we can, in, we can decrease the time constant and get much faster changes in membrane potential if we have less of a capacitance current. We'll get closer to square waves. We'll have faster changes in membrane potential. And this is what myelin's going to do for us. It's going to uh, decrease capacitance to essentially zero by spreading out the charges. Sure, it'll increase membrane resistance. Fine. But we're not worried about bringing charge in, we're worried about conducting charge down the axon. So what it essentially does is make it so that the membrane isn't robbing us of our charge, and it just slides along. It doesn't stick to the membrane. The distance over which charge can propagate depends on the ratio of membrane resistance, so resistance here, To internal resistance. So we're looking at a ratio here. We're going to take this, the square root of membrane resistance divided by internal resistance. The more internal resistance you have, the lower your space constant and thus the less distance that your charge can travel passively. Dendrites are not passive. There are active conductances there. So those ones out in the distal dendrites will need active conductance to help bring it to the cell body. But clearly that happens because they make it. If you were to increase your membrane resistance, which is what myelination does, you're going to increase the distance over which you can passively propagate that charge. And this should make good sense. So if our membrane is full of ion channels, it's going to have lower resistance because we have areas for charge to escape. Compare that to, let's say, a section of membrane where there aren't any ion channels. There's nowhere for charge to go but within. So if we have a long stretch of membrane with no ion channels, that charge can only move within that section of membrane. And this is exactly what we see in the internodes of myelinated axons. <clears throat> so we got a couple different passive properties. We got our 
time constant and our space constant. And these are going to affect the movement of charge without considering active conductances. Active conductances are, of course, very important to neurons, and that's going to be the topic of tomorrow's lecture, which we'll get to then. If you have any questions on the passive properties of membranes, go ahead and fill out that questions box, and we'll get to it whenever we see each other. See you later.